mine is the first, I'm going to follow this disclaimer. I haven't done anything like this since I retired from the state for like 12 years ago, okay? So be patient with me. If I have nerves right now, it's okay. But, um, and mine is going to be kind of like Hummingbirds 101 a little bit. And uh, so what I want to tell you about today is that hummers are one of the most important parts of our ecosystem because they're like major pollinators. Did you know that hummingbirds, they touch a, a, a thousand flowers a day. Can you imagine working like that? A thousand flowers a day. They pollinate. Um, and they are one of the most beautiful birds and the smallest birds on record. Their big wing beats are like 80 times per second. Can you imagine working that hard? And that depends on their size because you've got some that are this big and then you've got some bigger ones in other places. But um, they fly average of 25 to 30 miles an hour. They can dive at like 50 miles an hour. And their average heart rate is like 1,200 beats a minute, where ours is like 6 to 100, depending on how your heart works. But, and they have excellent eyesight, but a really poor sense of smell. They're extremely smart. They can actually remember their migration routes every year. They remember, like when they're working, they remember which flowers they've been to, and they can, they can tell, like, okay, that one isn't filled, filled up with its nectar yet. And so I don't want to go to that one next. So, and they can even recognize us. They recognize which humans feed them. So, and you know, if you've looked at videos, they, um, you can see people holding them and feeding them because they, they get to trust you. Okay, let's talk about hummingbird migration. This is just for the ruby-throated because some of those migration charts are amazing. But this is our ruby-throated. And you can see, um, like here where we're at right now, that they're coming up right here. And then they're gonna come up here, you know, and then move up. Um, and these little guys, you know, like I said, start right in mid-March through the first part of April, depending on the weather. Sometimes that complicates things. And I didn't know this, that hummingbirds don't fly in flocks. They, they, they do their own thing. They fly solo. I learned a lot doing this presentation, I'll tell you. <laughs> and they can fly, so these little guys can fly like 1,200 miles nonstop and never stop to take the, what, the drink of water or anything. The guys come first. They come like a week or two before the, the females do. And they said they establish their feeding and their mating grounds. And then the, the ladies come later. So, but the mating rituals I learned are so impressive. These little guys, they perform for the ladies. They will do like, like Tom Cruise top gun flying stunts. <laughs> and seriously, they will like, they'll straight go up and they'll just come down, stop and just do this kind of thing. They can do some amazing things. I watched some videos. Um, and that uh, due to their large pectoral muscles and their unique ball and socket joints in their wings, they can fly upside down and backwards. And um, they're the only birds that, in the world that can fly backwards. And I've never watched one do it, but I want to watch. And let's see. Um, but the good thing about the mating process, ladies, is that we get to pick. The ladies get to pick. The guys perform, and the ladies just point their beaks and they pick. <laughs> Seriously, that's what I said. So if the guy doesn't get picked, he just goes on to the next one. But the bad thing about it is that the ladies are become single mothers after that. He leaves. She has to make the nest. She lays the eggs. She takes care of the young. She usually only lays two eggs, and they're about a little bit smaller than a jelly bean. And their nests are like the size of a golf ball. Can you imagine that small of a nest? I would never see it in a tree. But, and then, uh, uh, you know, when we get through the spring and summer, they migrate back, the most of them, some of them stay, but they migrate back to Mexico and South America in the latter part of October, but usually leave your feeders up till like November 1st. But there are some breeds that stay around if you want to leave them up all year, it's just you have to maintain them well. And here's an un interesting fact. When humming hummingbirds sleep, they go into like a hibernation state they call toper. And some of y'all probably know this. But um, it allows their metabolism to slow down considerably so they can rest. And they maybe even look like a dead bird. They hang upside down when they're sleeping. It's freaky. I watched a video. One was going, whoop, whoop. <laughs> it was just, I was like, okay. So if it don't, it don't, and even if you try to touch it, it won't wake up. It takes them uh, 20 minutes to an hour to come out of that toper state. So, that's crazy, but anyway. Now, let's move on to some of our most common hummingbirds in Texas, of course. You've got your ruby-throated. 
Okay. It's common, mostly in the eastern half of Texas, kind of where we are, and it's the one we see most often. Then you've got your broad tail, this little cutie. And this is seen mostly in West Texas, mostly around Midland and Amarillo. Really and then you've got your buff belly, if you can tell why, because we have that buff color on the belly. And it's usually sighted in South and Southeast Texas. They don't venture very far inland. They like hanging out at the beach. I would be this bird if I was on <laughs> And we have the blue-throated Mountain Jim Hummingbird. This little fella is, best chance to see this is down Big Bend National Park in West Texas. Um, then they're black-chinned. I think we see these some, but they're common in Central and West Texas. Um, this one, beautiful, Calliope. This is one of the smallest hummingbirds. And it's usually in West Texas, so in, around Big Bend too, around El Paso. You know what it weighs? <coughs> 0.1 ounce. That's what those little guys weigh. <laughs> little, little, little. <laughs> then we got Rufus. I think we see Rufus some. That's usually only in the western half of the te of Texas. And then Mr. Lucifer. That's wicked. But he's around Big Bend usually too. And <clears throat> what, what, what have y'all seen? What hummers have y'all seen? Red throat. Has anybody seen any other ones? I've had a rufous pin at the brick. Oh, yeah, yeah? Okay. Anybody seen anything else? Just the rufous? We don't get these. They're so fast, I can't see them. But anyway, here's some other ones that do frequent Texas. Um, uh, this, uh, this is the only slide I'm going to read. Anna's, you got Broadville, Magnificent, Allen's, White Eared, Mexican Volunteer. Berlin, Violet Crown, Costas, Rivoli's, Green Breasted Mango, Plain Cap Star Throat, Green Violet Ear. These guys are supposedly around here too, but I didn't put pictures of those because I talk a lot. So. All right. Let me see. Did y'all know that hummingbirds' feathers are like a mosaic of tiny clear platelets? They're each filled with air bubbles. So that's when we get, you know, like when they move, it looks like a prism and they change colors because it's the sun hitting off of those air bubbles and making them change colors. So when they're in the sun, they look prettier most of the time than they do when they're in the shade, right? So, and sometimes the colors will just disappear because of the, the, you know, the angle of their flying. Okay, let's talk about how to track finally. I'll shut my mouth with that. <laughs> let's put out feeders, okay? That's very important. I have a whole list of this stuff here, but, um, Feeders are an addiction for me. I'm not going to lie. Once you get one, you want to get another one. They're also pretty. And you, you, get, you don't have time to cook dinner, and your husband's dropping at you because you're constantly, you're constantly feeling feeders or watching the birds. And there's so many on the market, from the very plain and expensive ones to the very nice looking expensive ones. My mom has one that she won't get rid of. It's like this big. I'm like, why do you need that? But, um, there's all kinds you can buy. Like, look, look at this one over here. Okay, there's a Sky Vodka <laughs> bottle. There's a Jack Daniels bottle. I think that's a Corona. That's a Coke bottle. And I think that looks like a wine bottle. And all they do is buy these little attachments off Amazon and make their own. You can do that. And there's so many different kind of materials that they're made out of. Um, you've got your metal. You've got your plastic. And you've got glass. I like the glass ones, but, okay, I don't like the metal ones. Like, let me show y'all what happens. I thought this was the most beautiful thing in the world when I bought it. Love this globe, okay? Started putting stuff in it, and this happened. Rusty, very, very rusty. And I couldn't clean it. I mean, I tried and tried and tried, and I just gave up. Okay. And it has a plastic bottle, but And there's another one. It's a different kind of metal, but it looks like it oxidized. I don't like that. I don't, it was like, it has like little things. I cleaned them, but they don't go away. So that made me uncomfortable. And so I kind of like the glass ones with plastic, glass or plastic, but I try to stay away from them. Um, if, when you consider buying your feeders, they like the colors of flowers. They like red, orange, and yellow. So. But you want to stay away from, uh, like, okay, I'm going to do that thing. See the little yellow center right there? 
that attracts bees. So even though it's pretty, you might have a bee problem with that. Where's it at? Where's it at? Oh, right here. Yeah, the little yellow centers. Um, I don't have it. Well, I do have a problem with bees because we have um, bees that are brought in from South Dakota, but I don't have yellow centers. So you want you want perches like this, right? You know, the little perches around. The little guys are tired. You know, give them something to sit on. There are you know the hummingbird feeders that they just sit there like those with, with the little flowers. There's nothing to perch them. Um, there's some more. This one is cool. This one's come out. It's it's kind of like a geometric shapes, and there's just little holes in all the deals that sit up, and it's got an ant moat. So if your ants get up there, the ants drown. And of course, this one sticks to the window. And this is my favorite right here. I love this one right here. That's a glass bowl. Kind of got off the deal, but that's my favorite right there. You can get it on Amazon. <laughs> Um, you're free, you know, you need to clean your feeders frequently. Some people say, you know, the experts say two to three days, but I'm, gonna, I'm not going to lie. It don't happen. I just, <laughs> I'll do it maybe once a week. But if that, you know, if the water starts getting dingy, you need to get it out of there. Um, let's talk about nectar and making your own. You can buy nectar, but if you buy, you know, hummingbird nectar, make sure that there's no, like, uh, artificial dyes or, you know, anything like that, anything artificial. Because even though the, the red water is pretty, it's probably really toxic to the birds. And if you make your own, what you need is four to one. Everybody knows that, right? Four quarts water to one quart sugar. You boil it five minutes, then add your sugar, let it dissolve, let it cool, stick it in the refrigerator, cool it faster, and then you can put it in your feeders. <coughs> Don't use substitutes like brown sugar or honey. You're going to kill your birds. Um, I don't know if y'all knew that. I did. I learned that. Um, the reason is that it gums up your feeders, and it is a choking hazard actually for them. And it also, um, it develops. If you think, think about it, the honey, it develops like a fungus, and if they eat it, they're going to die. So, and it also causes liver problems and hummingbirds. Uh, you may have heard of bully hummingbirds. It's not really true. What it is, is they're just territorial. They're all ter I've watched them. They're really territorial. Mm -hmm. So what they suggest to do is on your, your feeders, hang them in clumps, you know, like have three or four here, and then three or four somewhere else, and however many you all have. And that usually everybody gets to eat. Um, hanging your sunlights in full, I mean your feeders in full sunlight is not a good idea. Anybody want to tell me why? It's too hot. It, it's too hot. It burns their little tongues. <laughs> it really does. Think about how hot it gets in Texas. Plus, it deteriorates, in, you know, your your mixture. And if you if you leave your hummingbird feeders out in the winter, because there supposedly there's some out there, remember about freezing, because we do have freezing temperatures, so you need to take them down. So it's up to y'all. Interesting fact: hummers cannot walk. The little birdies cannot walk. They can use their tiny little feet and short little legs to perch on the, the things. And they can do this, but they can't do this. They really can't. They can hop. Some have talked, but they say they can't hop either. So what what feeders does everybody have? What kind of feeders do y'all have? Does everybody have just basic? Empty feeders? I have a glass one, and then I have some of those dollars for feeders, the plastic. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I was going to talk about, thank you for that. Those break. Yeah, that's yeah, another thing. Yeah, on the plastic rings. Yeah, on those plastic ones, you want to replace those every year. Because when they break down, there are toxins in that plastic that will kill the birds. And of course they're just ugly too, so. Um, let's see. Oh, this is a cool picture I'll show. Look at their little tongues. How cool are those? They're pretty unique. <laughs> They don't, they're not just a tongue. These little guys, um, they, can, they don't actually suck, they lick. And they can, when they're at a flower, they, they lick like 50 to 20 times a second. That's really fast. And their course are really long like that because they have to get down in those two flowers. But, um, what's cool about their tongues is that part of their tongue, at the end it's split like this, and then on the further up, it rolls up, and it becomes a straw. And then on the edges of it, it also has little uh, hairs. That that's how they pollinate when they move from one flower to another. 
Okay, let's talk about another way to attract these little guys, your bird baths. On your bird baths, um, all birds like to take bath, right? They're no exception. But on a bird bath or a hummer, you don't need like the deeper ones like we do for regular birds. You need a more shallow one on the flatter side with kind of low sides. Um, moving water is attracted to all wildlife, especially these little guys. And if you don't have one that has like running water like this, um, you can get what's called a water wiggler. <laughs> it's a device that it vibrates in the water and it causes the ripples, and they like that. So I'm going to get one of those. Is that battery operated? I think it's battery operated. Yeah. Um, and you can think about misters in your garden. They love that. I've never done it, but I've seen videos of it, and they just fly, they get so tired they'll just fly in and out of it, having a good time. And they'll have to go rest. And I'll go back again. Here is another. Y'all are going to love this. This is a cool picture of a pool party number five. <laughs> this has a little, if you can see, it has a little, uh, you know, bubbling water right here. And they're all hanging out. It looks like a hot tub, but it's actually not. <laughs> but they're all, it was a video, and I just did a still shot of it, but I thought that was really cool. Okay. Now, Miss, uh, what we, uh, your main thing, make, make your feeders and bird baths easy to find, plant flowers in your yards that attract, and the guys will come. Just be patient. And these are some of the uh, bugs. The birds like bugs. They do eat bugs. But I know we, we, we try to kill our bugs, but they do like bugs. And these are some of the bugs they like. Beetles, aphids, flying ants, day long leg spiders, mosquitoes, mites, and flies. And so, Miss Melinda is going to talk to y'all now about the plants that attract these little guys to your yard. I'm going to talk to you about the flowers. I don't put out hummingbird feeders. I make them work for their <laughs> I have flowers that I plant. <laughs> and then um, the main thing is having flowers that are available from March until November when they leave. So, you know, try to plan something in your yard that's blooming all that time. All of us enjoy watching the hummingbirds. They're amazing creatures to watch, the way they flutter about and do their work. But is it really necessary to put out the feeders? I'm sorry, Q. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like way. <laughs> if you have flowers providing for their needs, maybe you fit into the same category as me. So, the most important consideration when cre creating a pollinating garden <clears throat> is that you attract hummingbirds to introduce plants that are native to your region. Hummingbirds also love water, as she was talking about, especially moving water. So consider adding an outdoor fountain to your garden in the yard to attract these fantastic flowers. <clears throat> and they prefer bright colors, as she said, red, pinks, purples. Um, and they rely on that color to find their food. They're, they're, they're looking for that bright color in your yard. Look for flowers with lots of nectar and that are tubular, bell-shaped, and a conical. Like these petunias, they have the little, I don't know, you know, the little bell shape where their little beaks can go down in there and they collect the nectar. Um, this salvia, they have the little deals too. Um, they just play, they like flowers that they can get their beaks into and suck that nectar out. The long thin bills of the hummingbird enable them to exception, exceptionally good, be exceptionally good at pollinating long tubular flowers or flowers that are somewhat cup shaped. They're able to collect nectar from other flower types. Um, most rely on tubular flowers that are also quite vividly colored as they tend to hold the more, most and richest nectar. The tubular flowers, they have an advantage that they're able to protect and store more nectar down in there and then the hummingbird can get to it. Um, some of the flowers that are really good, um, this is a hummingbird bush or the Latin name Amelia, I think. Uh, give that bush a lot of room to grow. It can get as tall as 10 foot 
and white if you don't prune it back. But if you want, to, um, there's no need to prune, but if you do, do it in the late winter. It is a heat and drought tolerant shrub available in large dwarf and miniature varieties. The foliage becomes increasingly bronzy red from summer into fall and the reddish orange tubular blooms attract hummingbirds. Salvias, there's so many salvias out there, but they all have that tubular flower. There's, okay, there's over 900 species of them. Their easy care attitude makes them ideal candidates for the colorful low maintenance garden, sun, and a well-drained compost and rich soil may be all that salvias need to survive and give you months of bloom. Some salvias even tolerate poorer soils. Otherwise, cut plants back and apply a balanced fertilizer in the spring, prune, fertilize again in the midsummer, and they just keep on blooming. This is one of my favorites. I have lots of different sages in my yard. And they're so forgiving. I mean, they bloom, they get tall and straggly. I get out there and cut them back halfway in a week or so, they're blooming again, and hummingbirds are always around them. Um, sages, particularly the couple dozen species that have been cultivated for gardening, also produce beautiful flowers and fragrant leaves. Sages produce very striking, sometimes downright odd-looking flowers that can be white, purple, red, pink, and even black. Many uh, species also possess a lip structure similar to those found on an obedient plant. Trumpet vines, y'all have seen these riding down the road, they just grow on fence rows along the highway. But hummingbirds love them. Um, our native ones are the ones with the orange tubular flowers. They grow on the fences and trees all around our area. Um, so don't transplant those into your yard because they're very invasive. Nurseries can, that carry a more non-invasive type trumpet vine if you prefer it. And they prefer um, bright shade with no direct sun. Kufia. I think I'm saying that right. Bat-faced kupia is one of my favorite for the hummingbirds, and they love it. And it blooms all summer long. Uh, the first one here, that's the cigar um, kupia. Or, and it has, it, it's uh, Latin name is kupia lavia. Um, <coughs> I think that this is the pink mist, and then this is the bat face. The little flowers look. If you look at them, the where the little white. Um, there's like tons. Looks like a little bat, and they're not. I mean, they're just little bitty flowers, though, but the hummingbirds really do like them. And all of us, you know, we're familiar with lantana. And it's a good plant. It freezes back, but it usually comes back in the spring, early summer. Um, most of them are native, you know, around here, so they're uh, coming different sizes. I mean, from they can grow a foot tall to three, four foot tall, or even taller. Butterfly weed or milkweed. Um, they're usually. Native butterfly weeds are usually called milkweed. These are both a nectar and host plant for the monarch butterflies also. And we have about 35 species here. Most of us plant as Clipia tuberosa. And it's the one to three foot tall butterfly plant weed. And it's brilliant red and orange flowers. And you grow that in full sun to partial shade in well drained soil. Bee balm. This belongs to the mint family. It has a fragrant scent, and it's reminiscent of both lemon and mint. The plants possess clusters of small tubular tulip flowers. I don't know if you can see like where the hummingbirds, that, but they, each one of those little, is like a little straw that they can go into. Um, they have vibrant colors that draw them in, and bees also like them. That's why they're called bee bombs. 
They prefer moist, well-drained soil in partial shade to full sun. A bleeding heart. I've never really had luck with these, but I have seen them around. Um, the first one is the fringed, it's called a uh, fringe bleeding heart. And then the other one, let me see what other, Pacific bleeding heart. And both of these are native to North America, so they, they would grow here. And they're, um, they're named for the somewhat heart-shaped appearance of their flowers, which are difficult for some pollinators to get into, but not the hummingbird. And both species have flowers that range in color from pink to purple to red. Mm -hmm. some more, but I can't get in there. Um, cardinal flower, it's a favorite of many of the pollinators. It's bright scarlet petals, tubular flower shaped, and sweet nectar. The cardinal flower is highly flavor, favored by the hummingbirds. As a marginal plant that can grow in either damp soil or a couple of inches of water, cardinal flower is decent at filtering out the excess nutrients and uh, pollutants. So if it's like next to a, uh, if you have a backyard pond, you know, on the edge of the pond or something, they would grow good. It takes two years for them to grow. The first year, they'll just be a rosette of leaves on the ground, and the, the second year, they'll grow the red flowers. Columbine is one of my favorite. The um, Texas Gold is really popular. I mean, it grows real good in Texas. And I like the, the they just look like little spurs coming off the back of the flower. They're just, and they come in different colors, blue, purple, red, yellow, orange, white, pink, and a combination of some of those. I've seen white and purple. And um, they, they kind of prefer a well-drained soil that, you know, let them dry out and then water them. And I've never really tried them in a container. I've just, oh, they're in my flower bed and they, they seed and new ones come out. Garden flocks. Um, they fuse at the base to form a nectar filled tube. And it's no wonder the hummingbirds like these. It's good to know that this tall, pretty, fragrant plant is actually native throughout the U.S. It comes in purple, pink, white flowers. And, um, they they kind of, each little flower is like an inch. But then, I mean, just like that little part right there is like an inch, and then it forms this cluster, kind of like a hydrangea does. <clears throat> Obedient plant. How many, how many of y'all know what that is? They grow in the ditches and, and then if you take the petals and move them over, they'll stay. Well, they're kind of kin to the um, snapdragon, which is over, this one right here. But they're real good for the hummingbirds. Um, they're sometimes called false dragon head. And they have like three lobe flowers with one large lobe that acts as the um, the bright, it's like a little pad almost for the hummingbird to sit on and get to the nectar. And they're in the mint family. I don't remember if I told you that or not. Petunias, everybody has petunias in their yard, right? And they bloom all year long. And just beware of the Mexican petunia. It's beautiful, but invasive. Cat mints. It's kind of an interesting looking little flower, with, but the hummingbirds, it has those little tubes sticking off. It's an herb, and the foliage is kind of green, gray, grayish green. Their flowers are blue and purple. They're easy to grow in hardy plants. They're quite resistant to pests and can tolerate heat, and their blooms are also known to be long lasting. So that's good to know because you want blooms that'll, some flowers, a bloom, like a hibiscus, it's one day and it's gone. Daylilies, they produce bright color flowers, require minimal care, and they're almost impossible to kill. Mm -hmm. um, and they can survive in poor soil conditions, uneven sunlight, and even survive in drought. And I mean, you know, they come in all colors. So. 
sunflowers. Um, I wouldn't have thought that a sunflower really attracted butterflies, but I showed several pictures of them. They love to be in the sun and they have large, beautiful blooms. And have you ever watched a sunflower as the sun moves throughout the day? The sunflower follows the sun. It may start looking to the east in the morning, but by the afternoon it's looking at the west. So are they eating the nectar in the seeds or the little seeds? Uh, it's the nectar down in the... Is each one of those little seeds? I guess before the seed forms, it's more or less the, the soft part of that flower. I mean, because it looks like he's right in the middle. Mm -hmm. Well, no, though, he's up on the side. That would be what would form the seeds there, right, Richard? So I'm thinking it's just probably the early stages of the. They like direct sunlight, so. And they like to be watered frequently. They're not too picky about their soil, though. They like it kind of well drained and slightly moist. Pinstemon, just another little tubular flower that. It's pretty. They're available in many varieties. They come in different shapes and colors. Blue, purple, red, yellow, white. Um, the flowers are brightly colored and their foliage also comes in different colors like blue, green, and gray and silver. And they bloom in spring, summer, or fall depending on the variety. And they prefer moist, well-drained soil. Honeysuckle, this is, you know, another that can be invasive, so be careful where you plant it. They're fast-growing vines. <clears throat> they bloom mid-spring. So, you know, usually they're one of your first things. In about April, they'll start blooming in 1st of May, and by June, they're usually gone. So that's why you need to have, you know, they're a good plant to have early spring, but they're not going to keep feeding the hummingbirds through the summer. <coughs> Uh, they prefer full sun, but they can grow in partially shaded areas. Prefer moist, well-drained soil, and they're fast-growing. So they might need a structure to support them also, like growing on a fence or an arbor. Hibiscus. There's, uh, you have your tropical hibiscus, and then this is what we call perennial hibiscus that freezes back and comes back every year. Um, there's hundreds of different varieties, and they come in different, different colors. The tropical ones are so pretty. And, but I, I prefer the, the perennial ones, because they do, yeah, the flower only lasts a day, but they do bloom when they start mid-June, July. They bloom until the frost kills them. Um, <coughs> Delphiniums. They grow to be real tall, but they're real interesting plants. And, um, the bright blue color is pretty. Um, they come in shades of blue, white, pink, purple. They're not very easy to grow for inexperienced gardeners, but hey, we're all pros. And <laughs> they do bloom throughout the summer, and their blooms last for about a week. So that's the only thing. I mean, they're, they're pretty, but they don't last long. Coral bells, <clears throat> we usually buy them for the foliage because the foliage is so pretty and uh, it's available in so many different colors. They're large round leaves, but then they have these little spikes of flowers that come up. And they're tiny, but they're also, they come in different colors. I mean, there was different shades of pink mostly that I saw in reds. And they, they prefer to be partial shade. A red hot poker. I used to have one of those, and I think the gopher ate them. So I have to fight gophers where I live. Um, they're just very unique, and each one of those little flower parts, whoops, it's like a little tube that comes out, and that little hummingbird can come up and get his beak in there. They bloom during the spring and the summer. They have very long-lasting blooms. Um, they should be planted in full sun, but they can take some shade if the sunlight is like our Texas sun, you know. If it gets good morning sun and then the shade in the afternoon, it's probably going to do just fine. Coral vine, this is one of my favorites. The one I have is a, that grows at my house. I got from my grandmother's 
And the reason why I got it is because during the summers, I remember being sitting on her porch, and she had it where it vined up on a trellis, and it was always covered in hummingbirds. You could just sit there and watch the hummingbirds. I just so when after my grandmother passed away, and I, that was one of the things I said, I want some of that plant. And so my aunt who got the house dug it up and got me a start of it, and I've had it in two different houses now. So. Um, it's a fast growing. It does freeze back during the winter, and then about April, May, it starts coming back, and it needs a trellis or fence or something for it to grow up on. And they're, they're native to Mexico, uh, but they you can get them in the dark, the dark pink, rose, or I guess you call it white, and then the pink colors. Another one that, I have, that I've had good luck with is the Virginia vine or Blue Trumpet vine. And it really, it, it grows during the summer. It's just a green vine that covers my fence. And then about August, September, it starts blooming those beautiful bell-shaped flowers. And they'll, it'll bloom until it, the frost kills it. And um, I mean, this, this, the vine, it, it'll cover 10 foot of area very easily on the fence. And it, but if you plant it near a tree, it will even climb up in that tree. I've learned that. I had to move it. Uh, it prefers rich, fertile, moist soil, and well-drained, and it grows in full sun. Some afternoon shade is okay. Passion vine. How many of you have passion vines? And they come in so many different varieties, but the hummingbirds love them also. And they're kind of, some of them can be invasive. I mean, they'll, if you have some, you'll notice they'll be vined out and you'll have little plants coming up in your lawn way from where the plant is originally planted. So they have a fantastic root system. And that's just a chart with some of them. Uh, the one I, I have didn't cover the lupine, but that lupines is like blue bonnets. And I have seen hummingbirds <laughs> in the blue bonnets before. They like them. That, you know, it's about the time they're coming to Texas, the blue bonnets are blooming. So maybe that's why they come. And uh, diversity is just real important. <laughs> It's a good idea to use multiple plants in your hummingbird garden rather than relying on just one or two. A diverse hummingbird garden will be more attractive and will provide ample food for different hummingbird species throughout the spring, summer, and fall. And that is all I have. Kim? Okay. No, it's 330, 340. I see. Oh, I'll it up. And also, um, I forgot to tell you that you can only find hummingbirds naturally in the Americas. So they don't have them in China. Or not naturally, anyway. But anyway, in conclusion, and let me rec I mean, I don't have a lot of flowers, so I got, I got fever. <laughs> <laughs> so in conclusion, with a little bit of patience and some careful planning, you'll be able to track these little guys to your yard garden and watch, for them, watch them from a close distance. If they have the feeders with the, um, the perches on them, it's a really good photo op. Just saying. Mm -hmm. Just be sure not to get too close and scare them. Um, be consistent with your habits. Make sure you're, you're, you know, you have your plants watered and they don't die, right? And you have nectar in your feeders. And make sure you have your right colors because they like the colors. And if you can do the baths, that's great. Uh, I don't have one, but I'm going to get one. Because I saw some really neat ones you can make. You, I saw one made out of like a, the top of a, a metal trash can. Uh, on some rocks, yeah, and you can make it out of that, and then put one of those little water wigglers in there, and there you go. So, anyway, um, just be consistent with your patterns, um, and have them a little piece of the world to share, and they will continue to visit with you each there. They remember. That's all. I will add on the sages. You know, I said you can cut them back. I've learned. I have. They're planted around some of my trees in the front yard. And I've learned that if I trim them around one tree to leave the other tree alone until those start blooming, and so that they'll have flowers. I mean, I, I made the mistake one year, trimmed them all back and there were no flowers for two, three weeks. And the hummingbirds kind of got mad and left. What? She, she doesn't like us anymore. She took our flowers away. But 
So I've kind of learned, you know, and it doesn't take a whole lot of flowers for them, they'll stay. But I usually, you know, I, <coughs> 10, 15 hummingbirds in my yard, I'm happy. 